You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Chagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Vancouver campus. I'm here with uh, Shegan. Hi, everyone. Shegan Yadili here, and uh, I'm joining you from Kelowna uh, in the ancestral and ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan nations. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm also joined, very uh, happy to introduce to you, uh, Dr. S Sarah Purcell. Uh, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, it's very nice to be here and I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I am joining from UBC Okanagan on the unceded ancestral territory of the Silix um, First Nation people. Um, and I am an assistant professor um, at UBCO. Sarah, it's so nice to have you here. Your work is super fascinating. Um, when we talk about the principles of physiology, um, you know, we look at causal mechanisms like the, um, you know, our bodies actually need to follow the laws of physics and chemistry, things bind and do things. And of course, we are creatures that need energy. So we consume matter and make energy out of that so that we can go about our daily lives. And that's sort of your area of work, but it's not that simple. So tell us more <laughs> about what excites you about what you do. Yeah, I think if it was simple, I would probably be out of a job, maybe. <laughs> um, I, so, and you gave an excellent um, conceptual overview. So I study energy balance, um, which is the energy we eat, the food we eat, and the energy we burn or use, so energy expenditure. And I'm particularly interested in what determines that and how different components of that interact. Um, so as you mentioned, we need energy and we take that in in the form of food. Um, so carbs, fat, and protein. Alcohol also has energy as well. Um, and we use that to do different processes in our body, um, all metabolic processes. And that creates energy as well. So energy expenditure, which is the other side of the energy balance equation. And that is really composed of three different components. The biggest and the most basic is resting or basal metabolic rate. And that's the calories we use just to do our basic bodily function. So breathing, heart rate, respiration, um, immune function, things like that at rest. There's also physical activity energy expenditure. So of course we all have very different levels of physical activity and that's determined by the movement that you do. So not just exercise, but also fidgeting, um, even talking right now, that's movement as well. All of that is um, uh, physical activity energy expenditure and it's highly variable. Then a smaller so walking is physical and uh, I know. put that just, into my exercise right? diary. I'll just talk and I'll I be know. like, sorry, I got to do my exercise today. I know. Maybe that's like a, a novel weight loss. No, don't quote me on that. But I, I love um, it. Any kind of movement, right? So when I say physical activity, energy expenditure, people often think of going to the gym and that's part of it. But just anything that's that's movement falls under that umbrella. Um, and then the last component of total energy expenditure is the thermic effect of feeding, which um, is the calories that are used to digest and assimilate the nutrients we eat, the food we eat. So that's usually a pretty small component, about 10% of total energy expenditure, but that is, of course, directly that kind of is one part that ties energy balance together. Um, and that's also really highly in, impacted by the um, macronutrients, so the carbs, fat, and protein we eat, 
as well as the amount of food that we eat. So that's what I'm interested in, different components of energy balance. That's so cool. I mean, thank you. It's not really an equation though, right? Because I know from my, and Shagan, you probably know this as well, right? There are certain foods that I eat, like let's say a big family dinner, traditional dinner, right? With all the things, very carb heavy. That's a lot of energy I'm taking in. And afterwards I feel anything but energetic, right? Like- <laughs> I think we all do. We can all relate. <laughs> right. So it's not a simple food in energies there and now go off and do your thing. And on the other hand, um, I often feel most energetic when I'm just a little bit hungry. So why is that? I don't know if I have the answer to that per se. And, and it's super complicated. Um, I will say, so you know, if it was an equation, we wouldn't have issues with um, undernutrition or underweight or obesity. We would just use our mathematical mind and say, okay, I'm using 2,183 calories today. This is, I need to eat 2,183 calories. Like it's never like that. And the way we, that as humans, we actually track our energy balance is horribly inaccurate. Even in research, it's like very hard to do accurately. Um, but I will say with, with energy in, it's not very simple because we all live in an environment that is, um, uh, you know, you're bombarded with different food messages. There's also social and cultural influences. So your example of, you know, a big family dinner, right? Like you're going to eat more in that situation. There's also taste preferences. There's um, feelings like these more transient physical feelings like hunger and fullness. Um, so it's, it's very complex the, the things that determine what we eat. Now that can also impact energy expenditure. So directly, if you eat more, you're going to burn more calories, only a little bit, not a lot of you eat more, you're, you're burning a little bit more just to digest and assimilate them. Eating more, it's interesting that you say, okay, after I eat a big meal, like I don't feel very energetic because there's a lot of variability in how people respond to different acute and chronic um, uh, and differences in energy intake. So you can give someone a big meal and some people compensate like their next meal or is smaller, or maybe they increase their physical activity while other people don't really compensate. And that, that it has, you know, that's very complex. We're still trying to figure out exactly what determines that, but that what we eat certainly determines or contributes to energy expenditure and vice versa. Different parts of energy expenditure relate to energy, like what determines what we eat. So physical activity is a great example. Um, structured exercise can decrease hunger in some populations, but you know, it can also increase hunger, uh, decrease satiety in different situations as well. Um, and resting metabolic rate. Right? So if you think, okay, I'm burning a lot of calories at rest. Like if you compare like a 200 pound, six foot male with a, uh, you know, hundred pound, five foot tall female, they're just going to burn a lot different calories at rest. And then over time, your body is, is, is compensate. Like, it's like, okay, I'm burning 3000 calories a day. I need to eat more. So they're, they're very related. And I don't know if that answered your question. I might've went off on a little bit of a tangent, but um, we're getting there. <laughs> no, I think it, it, I think it's clear. It's not an equation, right? We all know that from our, our own personal experiences. Um, so what about the differences between people, right? So, um, and I, I guess I have so many questions. I think we all have so <laughs> many questions. Um, Cause I think eating and um, all of that, it, it's something we do every day and we enjoy it to, you know, to different extents. Like if I make eggplants, my children will not enjoy eating, but if I make I don't blame them. Eggplant is like the one vegetable. I'm like, yeah, no. Oh my God, it's like <laughs> the best. <laughs> Yes, I love eggplant, the mighty eggplant. It's so, <laughs> so versatile. Sarah, when you're in Vancouver next, I'm going to cook you some eggplant. Okay, maybe I'll change my mind. 
Um, so you, you talked about the preferences and sort of the cultural aspect of eating and the social aspect of eating. Um, what about the brain and eating? Because I feel like the hormones, the signaling, it's it's set up pretty nicely, right? Like we've got our ghrelin, we've got all these signaling hormones and molecules, we've got our insulin, we've got, you know, it should work. And I feel like we just override it with our big brains. <laughs> we absolutely do. So, um, you know, I'm sure listeners of this uh, podcast will be, um, you know, pretty well aware of a lot of the major hormones. So you mentioned ghrelin is a big one. Um, you know, that's like, the main like quote unquote hunger hormone um, and you know peptide YY that's another example um, of one of the more common ones that we see in research as well and uh, that's more associated with satiety um, but we can override those quite easily um, I always joke like I always have room for dessert <laughs> um, and, and I think a lot of other people do and so Yes, the biological system is very fine-tuned on paper. Um, you know, you eat something, these anorectic, anorectic hormones, so hormones that should decrease um, energy intake, those are increased after a meal, and the erexigenic hormones are decreased after a meal, typically. But we see differences in different populations, right? So, um, for example, after weight loss, is this has been studied um, as well, so weight loss, the body wants to go back to that weight that it was at. And so this is where evolution kind of comes in too, right? Like we don't want to lose a lot of weight because it, it's bad for survival, like long term. That's not the world we live in now, of course, where we have unlimited food available ability of really um, delicious food at, at our disposal. You know, you can call up Uber and get whatever you want or like Uber Eats or whatever and, and get whatever you want very quickly. And so we often override those signals and there are differences in different populations. So weight loss maintainers or um, people with heavier, uh, uh, higher body weight, um, different clinical conditions as well. So a lot of my previous research was in people with cancer, focusing more on the energy expenditure side, but um, you know, there, some of their hunger hormones may be disrupted as well. And that comes down in that situation to systemic inflammation and the impact on the hypothalamus as well. So it's almost the opposite problem of obesity. So while our hunger hormones and, you know, our satiety hormones per se are certainly really important, they kind of form the basis, but we can always override those. Well, not always, oftentimes. <laughs> Yeah, um, I override mine all the time. <laughs> I do too. That's okay. <laughs> um, and and I'm what I wanted to go in a slightly different direction, Sarah, in terms of personalized medicine, and because you know we've been talking about individual differences in metabolism and how intake and output of energy is really not a linear equation. Um, which then reminds me that there's this recent trend towards um, kind of pro producing like a micro analysis for every individual in terms of this is your body composition, this is how much protein you might need and how much uh, energy you might need and all of, and, and those kind of things. Is there is that really a thing? Is it is it is it something that probably would have a future um, or, or from your point of view, can we actually micromanage for every individual how much food and those each component of those foods they would, they would uh, need to take to kind of ma maintain an optimum body weight? What do you think about that? I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So yes, ideally in a perfect world, we would wake up every day and have, okay, this is your body composition. This is your appetite hormones. You, you know, you are more apt to overeat in these situations. So be careful with this. This is your gut microbiota. Um, this is how you digest food. So this is what you should eat. Carbs, fat, protein, energy. I think that there are a lot of gaps in literature to even get to that point. And even if we were to get to that point, there's a huge black box in terms of behavior. 
right? So we can create the perfect diet with the perfect amount of energy that you need, but helping people reach that goal is really difficult. And so it's important to design interventions that are better able to meet people halfway, essentially. So let's make them more specific. And then let's work with other researchers to um, implement these behavior changes. So yes, I think it's moving in a personalized direction, but there's a lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of how to implement that. Um, and I will say like, there's a lot of the research is focused on, um, you know, there's not a lot of research in people with different chronic diseases and conditions. A lot of it is, um, healthy adults or people with obesity without any other kind of chronic condition. And so, you know, in terms of energy balance, we don't know a lot of information about how those chronic conditions impact how much food you should eat. There's also a concern with these really highly personalized strategies that they're leaving out a large population of people who maybe have lower socioeconomic status. Um, so that's, you know, we need to make sure that when we're designing these, we can get all into the metabolism. And I love to do that as well. And we can use those concepts of metabolism to inform better interventions for different populations of people. So maybe for some people, they're ready to like have that energy intake goal and they know what a carb is and what a, you know, a gram of protein is, and we can help them. Maybe other populations or other individuals need a very simple approach, like just focusing on certain foods, focusing on changing their environment, things like that. It's I, I think at this point, the research is more, in my view at least, other people may disagree, but I think it's more about identifying what type of strategy is best for different people. Uh, I agree with that. And I... Um... You know, it it reminds me again of of, it, of what we've been talking about. How there's no one size fits all for everyone, and 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 um, so I guess my follow up to that as for me as an immigrant to Canada, um, I find out that um, at, at first Canadian cuisine, I kind of struggled <laughs> to, <laughs> to to find something that I would really like to eat, and then um, I, I visited maybe Edmonton and Toronto. And then I found out, oh, there's a big African market and I could, you know, but still getting getting the ingredient here to Kelowna um, was, a, was a problem. And I guess my question would be, um, well, not maybe asking you for like a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> I could do I could do that well, too. You after. know, it's funny. My husband does all the cooking. I don't. So I would not be the best person for a recipe. <laughs> right. You know, but I'm just wondering, is there like, has there been research how your body adapts to when you've got when you have you've you've been previously on a particular type of diet and now you kind of immigrate or immigrate and now you've got to adapt to a different diet you know uh, has there been research to see how your body adapts to that or or is it just basically since it's at the end of the day protein carbs and and fat it's going to be every it's going to be the same at the end of the day or is there more like nuance to that uh there's there's always more nuance or else i wouldn't have a job but it's so to answer your question i think what you're getting at is like okay so if you move and then you change your diet really quickly, like, does that impact energy expenditure? Does that impact health outcomes? Like, or does your body kind of bounce back really yep, quickly? Exactly. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has like really measured energy expenditure in a really good way with that. It would be really hard to do that study, right? Like you would need very expensive measures of free living, total energy expenditure um, repeatedly, and you would need a very specific population. Um, and then, you know, the, the generalizability, right? So you moved to Kelowna, which didn't have the food you wanted, but maybe someone who moved to Edmonton or Toronto, like their health outcomes are gonna be a bit different. 
I do know, and this is not my area of research per se, but I do know that there has been some study, like more like epidemiological type studies that has assessed, um, you know, changing food environments in like developing countries and the increase in these highly processed food on the food supply. And those, you, it's almost like directly linear, increase in processed food availability, increase in these chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, obesity, et cetera. And so that certainly plays a role. I also know that there has been a little bit of, well, maybe a lot, again, it's not my area, but people that have looked at um, different ethnicities and you know, first generation um, um, people in, in North America. So the example that's coming to mind is, is people from um, Asia or Asian descent coming to North America. That food environment, at least 20 years ago, was really different. And so they had a really high prevalence of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, et cetera. And so, yes, um, your food environment definitely plays a role. I don't know what to extend, and I don't know if anyone's really looked at that like on an individual level, but um, I think I may have answered your question a little bit. Um, it's interesting too that you say that Edmonton, you know, you were impressed with Edmonton's food because I lived in Edmonton for five years and I was not impressed at all. So it's just, it just goes to show like everyone's different in that way too. Thank you so much, Sarah. That, that's that's so interesting. And I, I always say, I don't think I can move away from a port city again. Like I'm so <laughs> thankful to live in Vancouver where we've got the fresh fruit and vegetables literally arriving at the port every day. And it, I do see a difference to other cities that aren't as close to those um, shipping lines, for lack of a better word. And that brings me really to an, another question. We've touched on this a couple of times, and that is um, in a lot of our assumptions, we, we talk about, well, we live in this, you know, time of plenty, but not all of us do. And um, the social determinants of, uh, you know, of health are often linked to food supply. We have folks living in food deserts uh, where there are no grocery stores in, in the immediate area to get fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and so a lot of those folks rely on processed food and, and that leads to poor health outcomes. And, and I think from an epidemiological point of view, we can really map um, a lot of those problems. Um, and you also mentioned sort of interventions in, in some developing countries. And I remember like um, there was an intervention to introduce red rice in, um, in a lot of uh, African countries in Madagascar specifically. That's the example that I know where they had uh, engineered the rice to have more nutrients in it so that folks are not always eating white rice, which doesn't have a lot other than carbohydrates. Um, so when I look at all of that, we go back to our equation, it's just energy and you use it and you need your macronutrients. I mean, it's not, I mean, you've said this so many times already, it's not that simple, but from when we look at it, not at an individual level, but at a population level, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge issue. And as someone who grew up in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, um, I have experience with that. Like I, it was probably considered a food desert and we didn't really have fresh fruits and vegetables. And there was not really a safe place to go for a walk or go for a run or like go on a bike ride or something. And even now when I visit my family there, I go for a run and they're like, oh my gosh, are you okay? Who's chasing you? Um, so there are a lot of access issues and you brought up a really good point about the processed food. So even though an area may be considered a food desert, the foods that are available are often very highly processed. And there is actually a fair amount of data coming out now that when you present people with a diet, so like an ad lib diet, like an ad libitum diet, so as much as you can eat, and you present them with these highly processed foods versus more fresh fruits and vegetables, um, they're going to eat a lot more calories with the, um, the, the highly processed foods. And then 
one study comes to mind. It was a very highly controlled study, two weeks of the highly processed fruit um, and two weeks of the fresh fruit and uh, vegetable and grains. Like I can't remember what they called it, but it was conducted at the NIH um, and everything was controlled. Like they have all kinds of different measures and the differences in energy intake between those two, two diets was about 500 calories a day. And you think over time, that's actually a lot. Like that can explain a lot of weight gain, the resistance to weight loss. Um, and it's really hard because as someone who is really interested in, in energy intake and energy expenditure and like, okay, well, why don't we just tell people to eat more grains and fresh fruits and vegetables and lean protein, but it comes back to that access issue, which is why, you know, people like me who are very interested in more of like the metabolic and clinical aspects, if I were to do a study like that and wanted to implement it, I would need other researchers and other um, healthcare providers to help me kind of implement my interventions, which is why, you know, a lot of this, a lot of nutrition science is, is very team-based as well. Um, and so it, it's, it's complicated because these foods impact our appetite long-term, they impact, um, you know, how we feel, they impact our health outcomes, they impact, um, you know, there's a lot of research suggesting that, um, you know, one family member eats one way, the rest of the family members are going to eat the same way. So it's not just about energy in and energy in and out. It's, it really integrates with your environment as well. And that's interesting because that's another one of those core principles of physiology that we live in an ecosystem and we interact with the environment and we adapt to the environment uh, and our entire metabolism um, adapts to that environment. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah, for all of your insight. This has been such a fascinating <laughs> window into um, metabolism in, in a completely new way. And um, I really look forward to hearing more about your research. I think it's, it's yeah. absolutely uh, necessary. And um, you would think that with, you know, the hundreds of years of medical research that we've been doing, we would have figured this very basic thing out, like eating and how we use energy, and we haven't yet. And um, and that's that's great for you because you have such an interesting field to continue <laughs> researching. Exactly, and I'll just give an antidote of like you know how young this field of you know energy balance and nutrition is. So when you think about astrology, you know we've been looking at the stars forever. We've been thinking about food forever as well, but in a different context. So the, the study that we, the equation that we use to estimate energy expenditure, often resting energy expenditure, was published in 1919. And that was really the, one of the first publications to really measure energy expenditure. The first, the discovery of the first vitamin, I can't remember the exact date, but it was probably, I think it was about a hundred years ago. And so that's when, and really before about the 1970s or so, 1980s, the focus of nutrition science was really on preventing malnutrition. Then we started seeing this overnutrition and obesity. So really we've been studying this for about 40 years compared to like hundreds of thousands of years of different, chem, you know, like chemistry, um, astrology, like different fields of science. So we're getting there. It just might not be in our lifetime where we wake up and we have like a, you know, personalized approach, but um, that's what we're trying to do. That's really interesting. Before we close, what's your favorite food, Sarah? Oh gosh, I don't, it's, you know, it depends on the day. I, can I have like five favorite foods? Okay. <laughs> I would say, well, maybe one is like a, like any kind of like cake or ice cream, like probably like not the healthiest. It's like a very like comforting. I really love almost all kinds of vegetables um, and fruit. And eggplants, we've established that. Well, definitely not eggplants. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's so context specific. Like I love having like a nice pizza with a glass of wine on a patio or like a nice comforting, like bowl of chili on an, um, 
a warm or a cold summer or ugh, I can't talk a cold winter night so I mean it really it varies so I, I really love all foods except for like eggplant maybe <laughs> what about you Shagan what's your favorite food oh it has to be like an African food so we I don't know whether you've asked me before I know someone has asked me before but it's uh so it's African yam so it's different from Canadian yam Okay. It's, uh, and so it's got like it's comforting with lots of carbs <laughs> and African yam with uh, hot it, we always serve it hot with um with fried eggs uh, uh with an omelette oh my goodness that, that is uh, so good <laughs> that is so takes me back <laughs> and it sounds very um macronutrient <laughs> balanced as well you have your carbs fat and protein you're good yeah yeah <laughs> That's perfect. And I you, love how you Claudia, what's of yours? Is that eggplant? I love eggplant. My kids, and I love lentils. So um oh, too, yeah. So it's one day, you know, my for Mother's Day, I think it was my kids in daycare had to write like the things that my my mom loves. And my daughter actually put down my mom loves eggplants and lentils. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, so, I, but I, I'm with you, Sarah. I like all types of vegetables um, in any way. And I love foods just like you, Shagan, that bring me back to a certain place and that bring me, that connect me to my my past, my biography, uh, my family. Um, so I love that as well. And I think that's something when we talk about food, it's that it's a powerful sort of social glue, right? And it's a it's a powerful tool of memory. Like we gather around food, we share food with each other, and we have memories uh, relating to food and to big meals uh, that we shared together. So um, absolutely. All right. Well, Sarah, thank you again. Um, and when you come to Vancouver and you too, Shagan, I'm going to cook eggplants for you with lentils. Okay, I will try them. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I look forward to it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shagan. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.